Hello everyone, my name is Jean Nolan and on behalf of Musculus Fletal Australia, I'd like to warmly welcome you to our webinar this evening, which provides an update on the topic of medicinal cannabis and chronic pain, which is a common feature of many Musculus conditions. I'd like to begin, however, by acknowledging the traditional Wurrung and Boonwurrung people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Tonight's webinar will be the last in Musculoskeletal Australia's 2023 Musculoskeletal seri uh, community, community Series. And I'm very pleased to outline the topics within our 2024 series. Our webinars will cover such conditions as psoriatic arthritis, arthritis of the thumb, axial spondyloarthritis and osteoarthritis and such topics as the role of the microbiome in our general health and how to get the most from working with your health professionals. Anyone who registered for our webinars will be automatically registered for our 2024 series, just to save you the trouble of registering yourselves. If you haven't previously viewed Muscular Skeletal Australia's website, I strongly suggest you do so. We have our online shop, as well as a wide range of information, videos, recordings of our previous webinars, tools and services, including our national helpline, which is available via email and phone on 1800 263 265. If you haven't already heard, Musculoskeletal Australia's second national consumer survey is currently underway. If you are a person with a musculoskeletal condition, please complete the survey if you haven't already done so. If you are someone who works with people with musculoskeletal conditions, please encourage your patients and clients to complete the survey. It's important that all people with these conditions make the most of this opportunity to have their voices heard and their experiences shared. Our presenter for this evening is Professor Ian McGregor. Ian is Professor of Psychopharmacology and Academic Director of the Lambert Initiative for, for Cannabinoid Therapeutics in the Brain and Mind Centre at the University of Sydney. Ian's historical research has focused on the effects of drugs on the brain and behaviour, and more recently on the discovery and development of new medications for the treatment of disease. Ian has a strong interest in the area of medicinal cannabis with more than 20 years of experience in cannabinoid research. We are extremely grateful to Ian for presenting this evening's webinar. And without further ado, I'll hand proceedings over to him. Thanks very much, Ian. Well, thank you very much, Jen. And it's great to be here. Thank you for the kind invitation to present um, to your community again and uh, welcome everyone who, who's joining us from all around Australia. It's a real pleasure to be here. And I did give the Coadlau lecture for Musculoskeletal Australia back in 2020. And this is a great opportunity to update the community a bit on the developments over the past three years with medicinal cannabis and pain, of which there have been many. Uh, here's just uh, some disclosures uh, around uh, possible conflicts of interest. We work with a lot of uh, different companies within the medicinal cannabis sector, but uh, there's no major conflicts. If you would like to learn more about the Lambert Initiative, which I'm the academic director of, then I point you to our website at the University of Sydney, and there's a lot of information about our research there, including our clinical trials involving medicinal cannabis and pain. We're also on Twitter, so please uh, check out our Twitter feed and we update uh, the whole world about our research and other relevant research in the area of medicinal cannabis through our Twitter feed, so please uh, check it out. Now, the Lambert Initiative started as a result of this little girl, uh, Caitlin Lambert, and I met Caitlin back in 2015, and she suffers from a severe intractable form of pediatric epilepsy called Dravet syndrome. And Caitlin's family found that by importing what was then an illegal cannabis product from Denmark, they were able to have a remarkable effect on her health and well-being. Kids with Dravet often have hundreds of seizures a week and suffer severe 
developmental and social uh, disability, and uh, about 20% of them don't make it into adulthood. So cannabinoids were quite transformational in Caitlin's well-being. And um, the transformational effects of cannabinoids continue to this day. You can see Caitlin now, age 12, who's uh, a cheeky young lass and in, in very good health, very communicative, and has had an excellent trajectory compared to most kids with uh, Dry A syndrome. So she's, I think, testament to the power of cannabis-based medicines to transform health and well-being. And it was a, a, a result of uh, observing Caitlin's response to cannabis-based medicines that led Barry and Joy Lambert to make an incredible gift to the University of Sydney to set up the Lambert Initiative for the study of medicinal cannabis. And we're based in the Brain and Mind Centre at the University of Sydney and conduct a whole bunch of different research studies relating to the potential benef beneficial effects of medicinal cannabis. It's interesting, um, Caitlin's dad, Michael Lambert, for importing that product from Denmark, ended up in front of the district court in Gosford because it was then illegal to import the CBD product he was importing. And he got into trouble for, for that. And uh, here we are eight years later, and uh, that very same product, CBD at 100 milligrams per mil, is now available on the PBS for children like uh, Caitlin, who suffer from Dravet syndrome. So this is testament to how far we've come in the last few years in terms of products that were once illegal, but uh, and used compassionately by families and patients at risk of uh, criminal prosecution are now available legally and indeed subsidized by the government. So we've come a tremendously long way in quite a short space of time. Now, the science of cannabis is actually quite complex. There's an awful lot to learn, and I find out new things every day, even though I've been in the field for more than 20 years. And uh, I consider myself a cannabinoidologist, which is a very long word, which basically refers to someone who studies cannabis and cannabinoids. And at the Lambert Initiative, we have about 30 cannabinoidologists on staff who are chemists, who are uh, pharmacologists and people who run clinical trials. Cannabis has been used medicinally for at least 6,000 years, and uh, the benefits were known all the way back in uh, ancient Egypt and Greece and India, uh, in China, in antiquity. And the current recent era of prohibition is something of an anomaly. It was really in the 1930s that marijuana, as it was known, was demonized. And there's a lot of theories about why that occurred. But basically, it's been a very sort of short period in history where cannabis has been demonized. And it's a bit of an anomaly compared to the use of cannabis as a medicine for really thousands of years. And what we've really seen since 2015 onwards is the rehabilitation of cannabis as a medicine uh, the war of drugs, as it refers to uh, cannabis, is largely over. And now we have a better, more nuanced view of the risks and the benefits of cannabis. We have very good science exploring cannabis side effects. We have a more nuanced understanding of how cannabis may contribute to hazards such as schizophrenia and uh, delayed development of the adolescent brain, school dropout and gateways to other drugs, and also cognitive impairment and driving impairment. We have a much more realistic view of these risks. These risks do exist, but we have a much better idea now of how to manage them. And there's less hysteria around cannabis related harms. At the Lambert Initiative, we're trying to develop the next generation of cannabis based medicines and therapeutics to help alleviate human suffering. And you'll be aware that there's two main cannabinoids that are currently used as medicines. The first one is THC, and THC from the cannabis plant is the main ingredient that gets you intoxicated when you take higher doses of it. It provides the cannabis high, but also a very useful therapeutic in chronic pain, spasticity of multiple sclerosis, 
chemo-induced nausea and vomiting, Tourette's syndrome, and it works through stimulating cannabinoid receptors in the brain and body, and is dosed typically at about 5 to 50 milligrams. The other major player is CBD, and unlike THC, it's not intoxicating. It has efficacy in treating epilepsy, as we saw with Caitlin Lambert, that's the main cannabinoid used in Dravet syndrome. There's a whole bunch of other areas in medicine where CBD is of interest, particularly anxiety, psychosis, and dermatological conditions. And it has a very complex pharmacology. We think it might boost the cannabinoids that are naturally present within the human brain and body. These are called endocannabinoids. And generally, CBD is dosed at a higher level than THC at 10 to 1500 milligrams. Now, THC and CBD and uh, the endocannabinoids bind to CB1 cannabinoid receptors. They modulate the receptors in the brain and body. The effect of CBD is more subtle. It modulates CB1 cannabinoid receptor function rather than directly binding like THC and endocannabinoids. And when THC and endocannabinoids hit these CB1 receptors, we get a variety of effects. We get euphoria, we get analgesia, sedation, and appetite stimulation amongst a whole bunch of other effects. So that's typical CB1 receptor stimulation caused by, CB, by THC and endocannabinoids. Now there's also CB2 receptors, and uh, they're mostly located in the body rather than the brain. And they are intimately associated with the immune system and processes of inflammation. So you find these CB2 receptors in the spleen and the tonsils, the thymus glands, the bones, the skin. And uh, when you stimulate these CB2 um, receptors, you get modulation of the immune system and inflammatory processes. And there's a lot of interest in CB2 stimulation for the treatment of pain, inflammation, and particularly autoimmune disorders. But if you stimulate CB2 receptors, you don't get intoxicated. It's the CB1 receptors that mediate, mediate intoxication. Now we get these endocannabinoids and CB1 and CB2 receptors all through the body. You find endocannabinoids and these receptors in skin, you find them in the gut, where they modulate a whole bunch of gastrointestinal processes. You also find them in the joints. So we know that cannabis, through its actions on the endocannabinoid system, is able to modulate all sorts of different physiological processes at many different sites in the body and the brain. And generally, if you elevate levels of endocannabinoids in the brain and body, you get beneficial effects, including pain reduction. And one of the most striking examples of this is a Scottish lady who had a genetic mutation that caused her to have hugely elevated levels of endocannabinoids. And as a result, she could basically feel no pain. She could undergo what we would find very painful dental and surgical processes and feel no pain whatsoever. But she also showed very low levels of anxiety and depression. So she never panics. And uh, the text here refers to a situation where she was run off the road by a van driver and she climbed out of her car, which was on its roof in a ditch, and went to comfort the other driver who'd cut across her. And uh, she's relentlessly upbeat. And in stress and depression tests, she scores zero. So elevated endocannabinoids are clearly of interest, if we can come up with drugs that do this, then they have an amazing capacity to alleviate not only pain, but also psychiatric disorders such as anxiety and depression. And we work at the Lambert Initiative to develop our own cannabinoids. So in the plant, it's not just THC and CBD, there's another 130 or so cannabinoids. And we screen these drugs to see their possible effects on pain, on anxiety, on epilepsy, and other conditions. And we also play around with their structures to come up with novel cannabinoids that are based on the ones that you find in the plant. 
And in developing um, these novel cannabinoids as medicines, we work with lots of cellular and animal models of disease. You can't give these new drugs directly to humans. So you work with a lot of model systems to try and predict what their effects in humans are going to be. So one example of that is uh, work that we do in zebrafish. These are tiny little fish and you can put them in a plate, 96 fish in a plate. And you can also introduce genetic mutations to give them conditions such as epilepsy and cancer. And then you can screen your drugs in these little fish to see if they're able to reverse epilepsy or cancer or other conditions. And this is an example of some zebra fish. There's 96 of them there. And you'll, we're tracking their movement and you'll see that there's lots of very sudden movements. And these are little fish having epileptic fits. And when we inject cannabinoids into the plate, you'll see that these sudden convulsive movements are minimized. And uh, these fish have exactly the same genetic mutation as Caitlin Lambert uh, does. These are Dravé zebra fish and are a very useful tool for screening the anticonvulsant properties of drugs that we develop. And we're very quick at screening these drugs because we can run 96 fish at a time. Now, some of you might not like worms, so I'm going to talk about worms and show a video for uh, about a minute. So if you don't like worms, then please uh, uh, you know, take a minute to yourself and, and don't look at the screen. Um, why worms? Well, worms are an accepted model of longevity. And one of the things we're interested in is whether cannabinoids can actually boost lifespan and health span. And um, these little worms, C. elegans, live on average for about 23, 24 days. And we can feed them different drugs and see how it affects their longevity and also how vigorous they are, their vitality or health span, as it's sometimes referred to. And so we're interested in whether certain cannabinoids might actually let you live longer and a, a more healthy life. And um, one we've tried recently is CBD. And you can see um, from this graph here that in blue, uh, the average the worms that were given no CBD lived on average for about 20 odd days. But when we gave them CBD every day, then they extended their lifespan by about 20 or 25%. So quite an amazing effect. And there's other cannabinoids that we're pulling out of cannabis plants that seem to have even more profound effects on longevity. So if you want to live forever, then cannabinoids might be part of the recipe to let you do that. We also do a lot of clinical trials at the Lambert Initiative, and I'll focus on some of them in a little while. But uh, here's just a, a list of current trials. We're working in things like spinal cord injury pain, anorexia nervosa, insomnia, osteoarthritis, anxiety, psychosis. We have a trial up in Brisbane that we're contributing to in pediatric palliative care. These are children as young as three who have a life limiting diagnosis, often cancer. And uh, we're I think for the first time worldwide, giving THC and CBD medications to children who are facing that uh, very challenging situation. And we're also doing quite a lot of work with exercise and sports. Uh, Sports-related concussion is a major focus. And also the idea of whether CBD can boost exercise enjoyment and performance, which would help people who have conditions such as diabetes, for example, or forms of chronic pain to enjoy the exercise that they do more than they normally would. So every day is an adventure at the Lambert Initiative. There's always interesting stuff going on, both with our worms and our fish and our rats and our mice and our chemistry, but also with these clinical trials. Now, I just want to cut to a topic of uh, interest in terms of what's changed in the last three years. And really, we've had a revolution, I think, in terms of access to medicinal cannabis just over the last two or three years. And an explosion of the number of patients who are accessing medicinal cannabis products. It's really quite remarkable. So I wrote a commentary for the Sydney Morning Herald back in 2017, bemoaning how few people could get medicinal cannabis. It became legal in 2016, but around about 2017, we only had a handful of patients who could actually 
access cannabis. The um, access pathways were very complicated and involved an awful lot of red tape and expense. If we move six years forward to 2023, the landmark of 1 million prescriptions was reached and more than 300,000 patients, 300,000 patients were getting medicinal cannabis products by that time. So it's been a remarkable transformation. And uh, I think we have to salute the Therapeutic Goods Administration, the TGA in Canberra, who's the main medicines regulator within Australia, for introducing a scheme that has really ultimately worked quite well in terms of promoting access to medicinal cannabis products, uh, whilst maintaining safety and quality of these medicines. The two main schemes that allow doctors to prescribe medicinal cannabis products are the SAS-B scheme or special access scheme. And that's a scheme where a doctor writes a script or asks for permission to write a script for an individual patient. And that's been the traditional scheme that GPs and other specialists have used uh, in order to prescribe for patients. More recently with the second scheme, the authorized prescriber scheme is, is much more used because when a doctor becomes an authorized prescriber, it allows them with one application to the TGA to write scripts for a whole class of patients. So it could be every patient that they have with uh, chronic pain, or with anxiety or epilepsy. And so that's really streamlined um, the processes for doctors and allowed them to really increase the volume of prescriptions that they can undertake. If you look at the SAS-B scheme, you can see that that's currently running at about 10,000 approvals per month. So that's 10,000 approvals for prescriptions every month. And there's been a total of 435,438 approvals as of November 2023, involving more than 5,000 prescribers, which is quite remarkable. There's about 30,000 GPs in Australia. So that's a significant proportion of GPs and specialists who are now prescribing medicinal cannabis. And in our surveys of GPs, they're quite positive about cannabis. The number of authorized prescribers has also greatly increased, and that's driving the large number of prescriptions. At the moment, we have more than 2,000 authorized prescribers who are prescribing to large groups of patients. We have more than 130 different indications being treated, and uh, the leading one is chronic pain, obviously of interest to the audience tonight. Second is anxiety, third is sleep disorders, and fourth is cancer and related symptoms. And we're seeing a skyrocketing, and we wrote a paper about this earlier this year, skyrocketing prescribing for mental health conditions. So anxiety we've mentioned already as the second most common indication for prescribing, but also things like PTSD, ADHD, and depression are also being increasingly prescribed medicinal cannabis for these conditions. Often, I would say, in the absence of good quality evidence supporting that prescribing. And that's one of the themes with medicinal cannabis prescribing, that the prescribing is often racing ahead of the clinical trial evidence. There are many different products being prescribed. The main ones are cannabis flower, which is vaporized. Uh, your doctor won't tell you to roll a joint with your cannabis or, or to have a bong, rather it's uh, intended that you use a vaporizer, which is far less harmful on the lungs. And also CBD oils and uh, THC oils are very uh, commonly prescribed as well, and less so things like sprays and capsules and lozenges. One trend that we're clearly seeing in the early days of medicinal cannabis, it was largely oils that were being prescribed. Now we're seeing a real increase in the popularity of flour. So more and more patients are vaporizing their cannabis and oils and flour are the two products that are dominating at the moment. If you get a product which is flour, then you'll get usually quite a nice um, pharmaceutical canister that contains very good quality uh, cannabis plant material. And that's typically what the label will say. 
It will instruct you on the amounts to use in your vaporizer, how many puffs to use and how often to repeat and the maximum you should use um, every month. And there's varieties of flour with different THC and CBD content. We're also seeing a change in the demographic uh, of uh, people who are getting prescriptions and more and more young men, that's males aged 18 to 30 years old, are getting medicinal cannabis products. And we think there may be a little bit of a shift from the black market to use of prescription uh, cannabis. The price of prescription cannabis is more or less the same as street cannabis now. And uh, it's relatively straightforward now for people to get a prescription. So we're seeing this phenomenon where a lot of young men who are perhaps using cannabis for entertainment purposes are doing telehealth consultations to get cannabis, which um, often based on saying that they have some anxiety or insomnia. And whether that's a good or bad thing, I think we can debate, but it's certainly something that our statistics are picking up on. And uh, this was a story in the Herald a few months ago, which uh, just described how easy it is now to get legal cannabis. Um, there's any number of cannabis clinics where you can get a telehealth consultation. You talk to a health professional, and once they've um, been satisfied that you deserve uh, cannabis, they'll write a script and that uh, cannabis product will arrive often by mail order uh, to you within a few days. So all the difficulties we were having back in 2017 have largely disappeared. And in some ways, it could be argued that it's uh, too easy now to get medicinal cannabis, particularly if recreational users are accessing it. Expense, however, is still a bit of an issue. Um, there's no PBS subsidy for most medicinal cannabis products. So the key question, I think, for scientists and clinicians, does it work? So do THC and CBD work in conditions X, Y, and Z? And at the Lambert Initiative, we spend an awful lot of time trying to develop um, clinical trial evidence and other evidence of efficacy. When you ask patients, which I guess is the most obvious thing to do, you know, does it work for you? Then the majority of both prescribed and illicit medicinal cannabis users rate their medicinal cannabis very highly for efficacy. So about 80 to 90% of them will say that their symptoms are very much better or much better as a result of their medicinal cannabis use. Here's a survey of people with uh, eating disorders that we did recently at the Lambert Initiative with one of my PhD students. And most of these people with anorexia or bulimia or binge eating disorder rated their cannabis flower as very helpful uh, for both their mental health and to a certain extent for their eating disorder symptoms, although much more so in anorexia nervosa, people with binge eating disorder found cannabis flower less helpful, presumably because it causes the, uh, the munchies, which might contribute to their pathology. So asking patients is one thing, but doctors often rely upon placebo-controlled clinical trials, which is the so-called gold standard evidence. And what does that say about cannabis? Well, some trials that we've been involved in have been very complementary. So we contributed to this trial where we used a THC CBD capsule or a placebo capsule and gave it to people who had severe treatment resistant uh, nausea and vomiting when they were undergoing chemotherapy. So these were people that didn't respond well to standard prescription medications used as antiemetics. And we found, to cut a very long story short, there was a highly significant reduction in nausea and vomiting when we added THC and CBD to the usual standard uh, intervention for nausea and vomiting in these treatment-resistant patients. Another big win recently in a paper that we published uh, earlier this year was in Tourette syndrome, where mostly young people have really problematic vocal or motor tics, sudden jerks, or an inability to control swearing or animal noises, really a, a very troubling syndrome indeed. And we'd heard from various patients with Tourette's that they were smoking illegal cannabis and it was having a great effect. So with Phil Mosley up in Brisbane, we ran a clinical trial and found that THC and CBD produced a highly significant reduction in vocal and motor tics, um, about a 40 to 50% 
reduction in these ticks compared to placebo. So very good evidence of medicinal cannabis being useful in Tourette syndrome and quite transformational for, for a lot of these patients. In this other trial, we gave very high doses of CBD to young people with treatment-resistant anxiety. We saw a remarkable reduction in their anxiety severity with these high doses of CBD, both clinician-rated and also self-reported. Also a reduction in depression and an increase in social and occupational functioning. And these kids were again treatment resistant. They were kids that hadn't responded well to antidepressants or psychological interventions. So again, cannabis-based products being quite transformational in difficult to treat conditions. So, and that led to a much bigger trial that we're currently doing, uh, a proper uh, large trial looking at, uh, again, the high dose CBD, both in anxiety, and also in young people in the Canary study, a separate clinical trial, who seem to be at very high risk of developing schizophrenia. Again, we're intervening with very high doses of CBD to see if that um, settles them down. But you're here more with an interest in uh, chronic pain. And so what does the clinical trial evidence tell us about uh, medicinal cannabis and chronic pain? Well, it's a bit of a mixed bag. The TGA reviewed the evidence back in 2017, and this is quite a dated uh, review, but generally they said that cannabinoids, that when you put all these clinical trials together, there's quite good evidence for cannabinoids, both in terms of their ability to increase, uh, to reduce pain and to change pain scores when you kind of distill all of the clinical trial evidence that's available. A lot of the early clinical trials in, that the TGA were summarizing, however, involved kind of strange products that are no longer used by Australian patients or used very rarely. There's been very few clinical trials of the products that are currently being used. And the other issues with the historical literature is just the poor quality of a lot of these trials. Lots of different pain conditions lumped together where they probably shouldn't be summarized together lots of different outcome measures and very few trials of CBD alone in pain as well. So the literature was also reviewed by the International Association for the Study of Pain, the premier international body for studying chronic pain. And they had a presidential task force that looked into this. And they basically concluded that the current evidence neither supports nor refutes claims of efficacy and safety for cannabinoids, cannabis, and cannabis-based medicines and called for much higher quality studies to fill the research gap. Here in Australia, the body that represents the pain specialists are very skeptical, and I've actually fought them on a few occasions at various conferences and debates, and um, their position is that uh, medicinal cannabis should not be prescribed for chronic pain unless it's part of a clinical trial. So it's something of an odd position, particularly when you look at the hundreds of thousands of patients who are now taking medicinal cannabis products in Australia for uh, pain-related conditions. They, uh, I think the horse is bolted and it's gonna be very difficult for them to put the horse back in the stable. So what does the real world evidence tell us from uh, patients? We've um, there's not just clinical trial evidence, there's a bunch of observational studies that have now been done tracking patients who are given medicinal cannabis prescriptions and following them up at three, six or, or 12 months. Uh, one such study is from the Project T21 in the UK. And uh, here's some results from a study looking at 800 patients with various forms of chronic pain, arthritis, back pain, neck pain, endometriosis, fibromyalgia, et cetera, et cetera. A typical real world sample of chronic pain patients. And what they found um, was that pain severity on the BPI was 5.81 out of 10 at the beginning of the study and 4.76 three months later. Pain interference, the extent to which pain interfered with the ability to function uh, from day to day went from 6.96 to 5.62. So these are kind of modest reductions, but still highly significant reductions uh, in 
pain severity and interference. So that's kind of what the real world data is telling us. Also, interestingly, in this study, they looked at whether patients gave up opioid use when they went on medicinal cannabis, and they saw a reduction in the proportion of patients who used any opioids from 55.1% to 22.1%. So a highly significant reduction in the number of patients using opioids. And also the ones that continue to use opioids, a lot of them reduced their opioid dose. So this is what the real world data is um, telling us. It's also interesting, you know, you, you talk about opioids and you, the skepticism of the faculty of pain medicine around medicinal cannabis, but there's trials that are looking at opioids, for example, in low back pain and neck pain and other prescription medications that are typically used for pain. And the efficacy story there is not particularly good uh, relative to cannabis. So this is a large placebo controlled trial done by some of my colleagues at the University of Sydney, looking at oxycodone and low back pain and neck pain. And basically, placebo tended to do better than oxycodone when you looked at these patients after 12 weeks of treatment or 52 weeks of treatment. So I guess the message there is some of the accepted prescription interventions for chronic pain, when you put them under the microscope, they don't work particularly well. So you shouldn't necessarily single out medicinal cannabis as being something that has marginal um, efficacy. Another thing that's emerging from trials of patients over time is improved quality of life. And my colleague, Thomas Arkell, tracked three, more than 3,000 Australian clinic patients in this study here. 70% of them had chronic non-cancer pain, 6% with cancer pain, and basically inquired into their quality of life over many months that they were prescribed different um, cannabis compounds. Uh, typically, they started off on CBD with very low doses of THC. And as is often the case, the THC dose went up a little bit over time while the CBD remained uh, constant. And uh, that's often a pattern you see with uh, prescribing in clinics and with GPs starting off someone on CBD to see if that has a benefit. And if it doesn't, then you slowly introduce THC to see if that gives an additional uh, benefit. And of course, CBD doesn't get you high and there's no driving restrictions. And so it's quite a nice way of doing it. Anyway, back to Tom's study. And um, if you look at um, quality of life, now these are quite complicated graphs, but um, normative data in the Australian population is represented by the gray line. And where these patients started is represented by the red line. And you're looking over 15 consultations that they had consecutively in a clinic. And you can see that their general health tended to improve a little bit. So you can see these dots going above the red line over 15 consultations. And their pain tended to reduce over time as well. So a positive effect on pain. Their physical functioning, perhaps not so much, but their limitations due to physical problems was improved by the cannabis product. Mental health tended to be improved. Again, you see these dots going above the red line and towards the gray line. And um, emotional problems also tended to be less over time, their social functioning greatly improved and as did their vitality. So I think this is a tremendously important study because what it tells us is that pain may go down a little bit with medicinal cannabis, but it's all the other things in quality of life that seem to improve in these patients, particularly their social functioning and their general vitality and outlook. And uh, perhaps we shouldn't be too surprised when you consider that THC tends to upregulate hedonic function. People have fun on THC. Uh, they find things funny. They find food more attractive. The senses become a little bit more pleasurable. And all of these things may subtly improve quality of life in people who are given medicinal cannabis products. The other really important point is that the side effects of medical cannabis tend to be quite mild and minor. So when people take cannabis recreationally, and they're heavy users, they tend to go for high doses and can get quite stoned and impaired. Most medicinal cannabis patients don't want to get impaired. They don't want to get stoned. They just want their pain and anxiety to go away. And so 
when these products are dosed properly, you find that the troubling side effects tend to be quite minor, a little bit of sedation, a little bit of dry mouth, a little bit of lethargy, dizziness perhaps, and some um, difficulty in concentration. But these are quite low percentages of patients that are uh, having these side effects. That's not to say that there aren't some patients that are vulnerable to adverse outcomes. We have to be careful during pregnancy and breastfeeding. Uh, we need a good reason to prescribe THC or CBD to children, such as end of life or epilepsy. And we do need to remain cautious about the adolescent brain and the impact of THC on brain development. And uh, of course, driving is a major issue. So people given THC medications by their GP or pain specialist are told that they're not allowed to drive. And so what does the science tell us about that? Um, how big a problem is THC when it comes to driving? Well, we've reviewed uh, that evidence and done quite a lot of research at the Lambert Initiative on driving. And generally what we find is that the crash risk of cannabis is about the same or slightly less than people driving around with a legal alcohol blood concentration of 0.05. So there's a, about a roughly 20% increase in crash risk, which is about the same as a 0.05 blood alcohol concentration. But it's actually less than opiates, it's less than benzodiazepines, and less than sedating antidepressants. Um, and we certainly don't ban people from driving when they're on opioids or antidepressants. So there's a little bit of a double standard. What we find is that people use cannabis occasionally. If they inhale THC, they tend to be impaired for about um, five hours, four to five hours. If they use oral products, they're absorbed more slowly and the impairment tends to go on for maybe about a maximum of eight hours. And we've done a lot of work summarizing every bit of available evidence on duration of impairment. So generally, if you're taking THC by night, you should be okay to drive or operate heavy machinery the next morning. CBD, even at really high doses, doesn't impair driving or cognitive function at all. And we've been quite vocal in New South Wales, at least, in supporting an exemption for patients. We think that when people use medicinal cannabis products as prescribed, if they wait two or three hours after using a THC product, they're probably okay to drive. That's what the literature is telling us. And we've been trying to support Jeremy Buckingham, who's trying to get an exemption in New South Wales to allow people with a legitimate prescription to drive. And such an exemption exists in Tasmania, but it's the only state or territory in Australia where such an exemption exists. And it makes a huge difference to patients to be allowed to drive. And uh, my friend Tom uh, at Swinburne, Tom Arkell, has recently, very recently, published a study showing tracking patients when they use their medicinal cannabis product to see if they're cognitively impaired. And he could find no evidence of impairment in patients using cannabis products as prescribed. Now, a couple of other things I want to tell you before we close up. One is the possibility that soon you'll be able to go into a pharmacy and get CBD over the counter. And uh, this is something that the TGA introduced in 2020. Of course, in the USA and Europe, you can walk into health food stores or uh, nutraceutical stores or even general stores and get CBD products. So in 2020, the TGA decided to downschedule low dose CBD, and it's a lot of gobbledygook on the slide, but basically what it means that they said products that contain 150 milligram daily doses of CBD or less are available over the counter, legally available over the counter, but first, these products have to be registered. And in order to be registered, you have to be able to prove that they do something useful for specific uh, uh, conditions, health conditions. The problem there is that the 150 milligram limit with CBD is fairly low. And we reviewed the evidence recently and found that most of the good stuff with CBD happens at 300 to 1500 milligrams. So 150 is a very, very low dose, and it may be quite difficult to prove that CBD 
does much useful at that low dose. There was one trial looking at whether CBD at 400 milligrams was useful for acute lower back pain, an Australian trial, and it found no observable benefit. So obviously CBD is not working for acute uh, low back pain. We also did a trial recently, which was quite good fun at Griffith University in Queensland, and we got a whole bunch of students to run 10 kilometers on two occasions, separated by a week, and we give them 150 milligrams CBD on one occasion and placebo on the other occasion. And we were interested to see whether that low dose of CBD would allow them to enjoy their exercise more, run faster, uh, and whether it would uh, they'd experience less pain. And basically, we couldn't detect very much, unfortunately, with 150 milligram CBD. On both occasions that they ran, their pain rating went up, obviously, after running 10 Ks. It's, uh, it's going to be a little bit of pain after that. But CBD didn't do anything relative to placebo in lessening that pain. We are testing a much higher dose of CBD, an 800 milligram dose, in a study of neuropathic pain experienced by patients with spinal cord injuries. And we're just wrapping up that trial at the moment. Unfortunately, I can't share the uh, results with you because they're not available quite yet, but certainly in the first or second quarter of next year, we should know whether this works or not. And what's interesting about this trial is we're also looking at the brains. We're doing a lot of brain imaging to try and understand what CBD does in, in pain pathways. So we're hoping that um, CBD will be effective at this very high dose in these spinal cord injury patients, and also hoping that we can understand the mechanism through which that might occur. And uh, we're still recruiting. We've got a final few patients to add to the trial. And so please get in touch if you know anyone who may want to be recruited. There are current low-dose CBD trials at 150 milligrams, and some have reported. They're all in insomnia, however, and none of them that have reported so far have worked. So CBD at 150 milligrams is not effective uh, in insomnia. And what this is doing, you know, because we're not seeing positive effects of CBD at 150 milligrams, although the TGAs enable the pathway for over-the-counter CBD until we can get a clinical trial that actually proves that it does something useful, then no products will be registered and we won't be able to get these in, in pharmacies. There is an interesting study that we did on the back of the last time that I uh, spoke uh, for Musculoskeletal Australia, uh, a guy called Daniel Lewis, who's a rheumatologist in St Kilda, got in touch after my lecture and said, why don't we try topical CBD and hand osteoarthritis? So we teamed up with a biotech called Aveco, and they developed a gel with 4% CBD in it, which um, we got people to rub into their affected hands, people with hand osteoarthritis. And we looked not only at their self-report of pain intensity, but we looked at their functional improvement by measuring their grip strength with a squeezy ball. And uh, that was connected to their smartphones and into the cloud. So we acquired a lot of data, data around pain ratings and uh, grip strength over several weeks of dosing. And we found with this gel, during the active dosage period, there was a very, uh, it was about a 30% reduction in self-reported pain and about a 20% um, increase in grip strength across the four weeks of them rubbing the CBD gel into their um, hand. And then when they stopped rubbing the gel in, uh, unfortunately, the, the grip strength declined and the pain returned. So, we're trying to develop this topical a bit more and do a larger trial with this topical product. It certainly shows some promise for uh, osteoarthritis. Another focus is with CBG, which is a cannabinoid I haven't discussed today, but we are working with clinical trials with other cannabinoids other than THC and CBD, including CBN, which seems to be very useful in insomnia, and CBG, which we think might be a bit of a game changer particularly in osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. So if you look at rat and mouse and other animal models, there's quite a strong signal for CBG uh, for efficacy with inflammation 
related to arthritis and also dermatological conditions. And we certainly understand a lot of the receptor related effects of CBG that may underlie this preclinical efficacy. What you're seeing around the world, particularly in Europe and the USA, is that CBG topicals are already widely available, not in Australia, but uh, certainly in the Europe and USA. And we're hearing lots of reports of topical CBG creams uh, having benefits, particularly in muscle and joint pain, uh, arthritis and other inflammatory conditions. So we're trying to get organized to run a large trial of a topical CBG product in arthritis, hoping to get that off the ground in the next few months. So anyway, I'll stop there. Uh, thank you for your attention. And I'm very happy to take some questions. Fantastic, Ian. Thank you so much. And um, we have got a fairly uh, sort of short time for questions, and there have been a couple that have come through. Uh, one, one that's probably fairly um, critical is uh, just, you know, with regards to people finding out um, who is a registered uh, prescriber of, of um, medicinal cannabis. Uh, where, where can people find that information? Because obviously not all GPs, uh, authorised or able to uh, provide a prescription? Yes, it, it's a it's, it's quite a difficult situation in that GPs are not really allowed to advertise uh, their medicinal cannabis um, prescribing. Uh, word of mouth is useful, but um, Dr. Google will very quickly put you in touch with <laughs> uh, any number of cannabis clinics where you can do telehealth uh, consultations. Um, there's also a resource called Hona Lee, which is H-O-N-A-H-L-E-E, -E, which I believe may point to some prescribers as well. But really, we have more than 5,000 of them now in Australia, so it's uh, it's much easier than it was uh, six years ago or so to, to track them down. But um, if you're completely in the dark, then going through a telehealth consultation at a cannabis clinic, which you'll easily find on Google, is probably um, the easiest option. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Someone's also asked how they might be able to uh, be involved in that hand OA topical cannabis gel trial. Are you still looking for participants for that one, in? Well, the CBD catch-up trial is concluded. We're just publishing that at the moment, and we're just organizing the funding for the CBD and CBG trials. So certainly if they want to write to me or the Lambert Initiative website actually has a resource where you can register as someone who's interested to be involved in our clinical trials and then we'll keep you on record. And when that trial starts, we can get in touch. On it. But I'm happy to also uh, receive an email at the address on the screen there. Okay, and someone has asked about whether you can drive on on when you're using medicinal cannabis, but basically it sounds like it's um it's not legal in in many states. Yes, so CBD you're fine. I think it's really important to know that if you're CBD only, then there's no driving issues at all, and you can't get pinged by the police. But if you're using a THC product, your doctor will tell you that you're not allowed to drive while you're using that product unless you're in Tasmania. Now there's major, there's inquiry in Queensland, the Queensland government's uh, looking into this issue. The New South Wales government's also under pressure as is the Victorian government. So I expect to see change on this in the next six to 24 months. as an area we're working on quite vigorously. Uh, for example, if you're in the UK, Ireland, Canada, number of European countries, if you have a legitimate prescription for a medicinal cannabis product, even if it contains THC, you're fine to drive, as long as you don't feel impaired. If you if you jump in the car when you feel impaired, then you are breaking the law. Uh, but in that regard, we need to just make it the same as opioids or benzodiazepines or any other sedating prescription drugs. There's no real reason to hold cannabis to a different standard. Yes, and um, you've covered quite a few. You've mentioned chronic pain and osteoarthritis uh, this evening. Uh, someone sort of asked specifically about any trials in relation to medicinal 
cannabis and ankylosing spondylitis. I'm thinking, and if you haven't mentioned that tonight, that there probably isn't anything specifically looking at that musculoskeletal condition and medicinal cannabis. Not that I'm aware of, and uh, this is, you know, the, as I was saying earlier, the, the, all these reviews that say that medicinal cannabis doesn't work very well or the evidence isn't very good, they tend to distill, you know, arthritis trials and fibromyalgia trials and other other conditions into this one situation. And we don't have very nuanced evidence around many different um, conditions. And I'd love to see a really good quality study of THC or CBD in back pain or neck pain. I mean, we, we have tens of thousands of patients now in Australia taking cannabinoid products for neck pain and back pain, but we don't have one good quality clinical trial, apart from that study I mentioned, which showed that 400 milligrams didn't work on a single occasion when it was given to people with severe back pain. But you really want to track them over several weeks. And uh, because this is another thing we're hearing that the effects of cannabinoids may kind of creep up on you. So you don't get an immediate uh, relief in, in many conditions, but after two or three weeks, you feel better, your quality of life's improved and you're not so focused on, on your pain. Mm -hmm. And and what is there a sort of a fairly typical cost? If people were to get a prescription for medicinal cannabis, would there be a sort of a, a typical sort of cost or expense range? Um, or is it really too hard to sort of say how much people might need to pay? I know, I know it's certainly not cheap. <laughs> no, I, th I think, you know, typical expenditure would be about $200 per month. Um, unfortunately, you know, I was saying that high doses of CBD tend to be more effective than low doses. And if to get up to these 600, 800 milligram doses of CBD that are very effective, for example, in anxiety and epilepsy that can really increase the cost hugely and um, to you know five or six hundred dollars a month or, or even more i think it's only a matter of time before we have um some kind of government subsidy um i think and for that we just need to make the clinical trial evidence stronger we need better quality clinical trials because that's essentially how the tga works if you provide good quality evidence they'll look at a subsidy so we need to keep, you know, plugging away at these trials, improving the evidence base. And then I think it will be inevitable that we'll have PBS subsidy for uh, a range of medicinal cannabis products. Mm. Well, <clears throat> thank goodness for the uh, Lambert Initiative, because uh, are, there, are there many other institutions in Australia that are conducting research with medicinal cannabis currently? Well, I mentioned Tom Arkell, who's a... Uh, uh, Oh, yes, yeah, Swinburne. He's a, he's a Lambert alumnus, so he was my PhD student, and he's uh, doing very well down at Swinburne University. That was his quality of life study, which I thought was terrific, um, and also doing some great work on driving. And there are other, um, you know, pockets of excellence. I mean, we're working with people all around Australia, for example, that trial up in Brisbane. We've got, you know, the, the trial with uh, paediatric palliative care, and also a, a schizophrenia trial up there and some very good work with youth mental health at origin in Melbourne as well. And some of the companies, you know, for example, in Western Australia, a company called Emiria are doing quite good research with their large number of patients that are going through their clinic. So we're, we're certainly seeing, you know, Australia is a bit of a hotbed now internationally for medicinal cannabis research. And we're, recognized for the quality and, and the number of uh, trials and other studies that are going on here. Mm. Well, that, that's great to hear, Ian, because obviously, um, you know, the, the therap Therapeutic Goods Administration requires that research to really then sort of consider the possibility of, of medicinal cannabis being um, uh, listed on the PBS and so on or receiving PBS subsidies. So uh, so that's great to hear that the, the research is really ramping up in relation to various aspects. Um, yeah, it's, um, it makes a huge difference clinically as well. So for example, the trial we did in Tourette's, you know, it took about seven years to do that trial, but then you actually have very good quality evidence that, you know, THC reduces ticks. And, and that kind of, it's not just within Australia, that flashes all around the world. And all the neurologists and neuropsychiatrists that are working 
with people with Tourette's become aware of that and it gives them another treatment option. So, you know, a good quality trial can reverberate and affect the health and well-being of tens of thousands of people internationally. That's why it's so important to, to do that work. Mm. And just one very last quick question. Uh, the use of CBD oil in a massage, is that going to cause any risk for, or, um, for the therapist who might be um, uh, undertaking the massage? Well, you may get transdermal absorption of the CBD. In fact, in our hand osteoarthritis trial, that's exactly what we were relying on, <laughs> that absorption of CBD. Um, so there's no risk to... The therapist, I, I I would say, because you know CBD basically doesn't have any side effects to to speak of, and there's no risk of a positive roadside drug test as well with CBD. You just have to watch out if the topical does contain THC, then you may be possibly at, at risk of intoxication and a positive roadside drug test. But it would very much depend upon the formulation of the um, lotion that was being used and the absorption characteristics. So I think it's probably quite a long shot that you would get um, intoxicated with uh, with a THC lotion uh, transdermally. Okay, so looking on that, uh, that note, we're right on or just after 8 p.m. Um, uh, this evening. Thank you so much, Ian. Always uh, you do a wonderful presentation with so much information on such a, a topic which is of great interest and importance to so many people. So thank you sincerely once again, especially after your recent uh, experience of having COVID. Um, and look, thank you to everyone who has joined the webinar this evening. Um, and I ask if you could uh, fill in the exit survey when we finish up in a minute. And also don't forget to um, uh, complete our National Musculoskeletal uh, survey if you haven't already done so and if you're a clinician please let uh, your clients and patients know about it as well so on that note good evening everyone um, and have a lovely uh, Christmas and holiday season good night good night Thank you.